Hi, my name is Stephanie and today I want to talk to you about Christianity and mental health, specifically in how to respond to others in the realm of mental health and even more specifically I think this would be something that parents especially need to hear because this just isn't something a lot of people talk about and it is very important in my opinion. Quite frankly, the lack of conversation around it has led people to horrible dark places that they didn't need to be in because other people didn't know how to respond, especially when under the influence that they were somehow responding more Christianly <laughs> in the negative response that they gave. Let me begin by informing you that not everything is just the devil. Not everything is like a demonic spirit. Matthew 12 says, then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is this not the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Blaming everything that you don't like or don't understand on the devil is the same kind of fallacy that the Pharisees fell under. They didn't understand how Christ could heal and cast out demons. So they're like, aha, you are of the devil and you are a demon daily. <laughs> that kind of idea can be really pervasive in Christianity. We like to use scripture and Christianity as a means of using a kind of a quick judgment. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. We are supposed to have wisdom. There's always someone who is going to find a way to make it a bad thing and then justify it through some sort of Christian means. Using discernment to judge between what is demonic or what is a medical, physical, mental kind of ailment or even something that might be obedience to God that was an instruction given in private is really important before you condemn someone or call them the devil or <laughs> possessed for doing something or being ill in some way that has nothing to do with that. Yes, we absolutely can go through spiritual attacks, but even then, how we respond to people is really important and it can also influence how they get through those kinds of attacks. Shaming people, dismissing them, waving it off and telling them to just go and pray is not how we lift each other up. I believe that there are definitely times when I've had thought patterns that were demonically influenced where I would become depressed and reject God and go down kind of this path, but I've had many times where it wasn't even remotely in regards to that. There would be times where one night I would be in the spirit and God would use me in a spiritual way that was super like intense and really strong and amazing. And then even that night or the next day be thinking thoughts passively that people like to imagine Christians just couldn't possibly think about. Recognize that science is the study of God's creation. How does what God created work? We know that God has created us to need each other. It can be really annoying but that's just simply the truth. We know that we have a personal relationship with God where he hears about our struggles and we bring those things to him even though maybe other people might not think they're a big deal. But yet God responds appropriately to us to help us through those things that are a big deal to us. But when it comes to mental health, a lot of times Christians suddenly suspend that. Like that doesn't exist or that just isn't a thing. Why would you need to talk to a therapist or talk to a trusted individual? You should just go talk to God. But we need other people. That's why God made us so diverse. He literally created us to need other human beings. We use psychology, another form of studying what God has created as in human beings, trying to understand how the mind works, trying to understand how we react to things, etc. And through psychology, we understand as well the detrimental effects of isolation. Shaming someone for going to therapy or wanting to go to therapy, wanting to get help or getting help 
is essentially telling God that he made a mistake in making us so that we need other people and or that that individual, because of whatever feeling you particularly have, doesn't get to need other people. In addition, we have our problems, but we tend to like to compare others. Your life's not that bad, get over it. Yet, that's not the response God gives us when we come to him about our problems that might be kind of stupid to other people. I've yet to hear God, when I go before him in distress, dismiss me and tell me to just shrug it off and get over it. By doing this to other people, we're not only being hypocritical as we are ourselves think we have issues that are big, but we're also not responding in line with how God responds to us. He comes to our aid. While obviously we can't just go and like save everyone out of their issues, we can respond in compassion and empathy. God gave us the ability to research and to find out things and learn about the world around us and how things work and learn about medicine and other things to help us in how we live our lives, basically. Knowing that we have a condition, a disability, an illness, or whatever else, disorder, doesn't make us less worthy as human beings. It doesn't make God love us less. It doesn't make us have less faith. These kinds of weird concepts seem to be really pervasive in church and it's really harmful because people find out like, oh, you know, I deal with anxiety and people are like, oh, well, either you can't have that, it's bad of you to have that, you're not allowed to say you have that, you're not allowed to get help for that. That doesn't really make sense. I firmly believe that God reveals to us our weaknesses so that we can either improve upon them or find ways that are adaptive to deal with them and not let them be our complete and utter downfall. Many people are against medication for mental health, and I'm not saying that you have to be, like, for it, because I used to be like that too. I used to be very against it because I saw how it changed people. I saw people be overprescribed. I've, I've just seen a lot of the negative sides of things. But God has also <laughs> revealed to us the knowledge of understanding how neurotransmitters work inside of our brains and that some situations there are things like chronic depression where your brain isn't doing its job quite right and we know how to help that and I don't think there's anything wrong with taking that help because I'm one of those people. I would lament for days because I didn't understand how I could consider myself Christian and yet wish to not be on this earth. Suicide is wrong, so I would be so angry and upset and hate myself even more for wanting to do that, for thinking about that. That self-hatred for myself <laughs> didn't make it go away. Knowing that it was selfish, knowing that it wasn't the Christianly thing to think about, it wasn't whatever, I don't know, whatever else, it, that didn't take it away. Loving God didn't take it away. God would still use me in mighty ways and yet the next day I would wonder what it was like to do things that I shouldn't to be able to see Jesus face to face for a minute. Depression loomed in my life since I was a young teenager. Did that mean that I loved God less? Did that mean that God loved me less? I don't think so. I had no control over what the neurotransmitters in my synaptic clefts did inside of my brain. Should I have to suffer? Should I have to be in that cycle of shame and guilt and playing a very dangerous game with my life just so that some random person who is feeling self-righteous about what they think should feel justified and better about themselves? D does that make any sense? And that's even to me. Is it better for me to suffer and possibly do something that I feel is wrong because I thought I would be above that somehow? God did not tell us that we were not allowed to ask for help. He didn't tell us we weren't allowed to treat sickness and illness. God still remains my healer, 
but even then, sometimes he's given us answers and there's nothing wrong with taking those answers. Another amazing thing about God is that in the way that he created us is that often what's going on in the inside will manifest itself on the outside. Additionally, we have different forms of communication. Typically, we prefer a verbal form of communication, such as like speaking to be able to more plainly communicate and explain, but sometimes some things are so big on the inside for us, we are hurting in such a way that we cannot express in words so they begin to be communicated through behaviors. Seeing someone who is mentally ill or going through a difficult time express that pain through marks on their skin, vomit in the toilet, or even just tears in their eyes is them trying to communicate in some way that there's something so big going on inside that they don't have the words. We like to tell people to just pray, but sometimes we need each other. Sometimes we're not strong enough by ourselves. Sometimes we need practical measures. In the case of Elijah, we see him provided food and drink and encouraged to eat, and he's allowed to sleep when he's feeling depressed and, quite frankly, sounds a little bit like what we would traditionally classify as suicidal. First Kings 19, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. We literally see someone who is considered an esteemed prophet in the Bible expressing that he wants God to take away his life because he cannot handle this. Yet, we don't think, ooh, Elijah, you know, he didn't have, he was a bad person. He was just a bad person, you know, he was just full of a demonic spirit thinking that. We don't, we don't just brush off Elijah. We see that God doesn't just brush off Elijah either. He offers him something, even a practical help to be able to help him go forward and continue. It's okay if you don't know what to do. It's scary to see someone in distress. The worst thing you can do is to tell someone who is racked with pain so great that they can no longer express with words, so they are only expressing it through some sort of destructive means, self-destructive most likely, as a way of communicating what is going on, that they should stop asking for attention. To just stop what they're doing and get over it. That they're being demonic. That if they just read the Bible, it would all go away. And if they just prayed, it'd be just sunshine and rainbows. With that reaction, you're likely to add another weight of guilt and shame. And the only means of getting it out will be done in secret. And when that happens, loneliness and shame compound and that spirals out of control. And there you are just sitting on your high horse, imagining yourself somehow holier than the person over there who thought they could be a human being in crisis. God expects, even out of just our humanity, that when our children ask when in need, that we give them what they need. Matthew 7, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Please realize that when people, especially like your family or your children, reach out to you, God expects you to meet them there. Somehow, when it comes to mental health and disorders, we see parents who do indeed hand over a stone or a serpent, void of love or compassion or care. I don't understand what it is about the mind that makes it so hard for people to understand that we are human. We are still in bodies, we age, we break bones, we get sick, we are hurt, we get tempted, we hurt other people. We are human beings in a human flesh body. 
If someone falls and breaks their bone, will you tell them that the pain isn't that bad? Will you tell them to go ask God to heal it and refuse them any form of medical care, even down to a Tylenol and a wrap to at least keep their bone in there? I would hope that you would take them to the doctor or if you are somehow able to care for them, I hope you would do that because that just is kind of the reasonable thing to do. The power of life and death is in the tongue. When the church doesn't talk about mental health and shuns it, we often accidentally use our tongue to further punish people who are in pain. Would it be okay for me to ask you to continue to ba play baseball with your broken arm that hasn't been tended to? Just get over it. We all deal with pain. Please understand that mental illness, pain, disorders, whatever else are just as serious as that broken bone. God has given us ways to help and treat mental ailments just as much as he has given us wisdom and knowledge about how to treat a physical issue like a broken bone where we have x-rays and casts. Psychology as God is foolish, but psychology itself is just another form of studying what God has created. Just like science as God is foolish, however, science is just supposed to be studying what God has created. While we do know many things about ourselves, whether revealed through just common sense or even in the scripture, psychology continues to take a look into those things to help find ways to provide help and care to people who need help. It is okay to not know all the answers, but if you find yourself encountering a person who is in pain, whether they are expressing that pain in self-destructive ways or not, please remember to respond the way that Christ responds to you when you come to him broken and in pain. Listen, be there as another human being. In nearly every case, the person in pain already knows that their actions aren't ideal, that they're self-destructive or bad or selfish. They don't need a lecture or a reprimand. They need help. If you don't know what to do in these situations after you've listened and after you've been compassionate, I highly suggest you seek out a professional. I'm not one. I'm not a professional. I am just an individual out here on the internet. I can only tell you like some basic things to help you. A lot of times people are going to need to go to that professional directly for them to help them just like you would have to go directly to a doctor for a physical issue for help in that situation. But when you're responsible for that person, such as in the case with children, you need to know constructive ways to help them through. Our first reaction isn't always the best one and it isn't always even the biblical or Christian one that we like to think it is. In the end, it really is as simple as remembering to have the same compassion that Christ has for us. Just love one another. Thank you for watching today. I hope that it was informative or helpful in some way. If you feel that it was, go ahead and hit the like button. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to hear more topics that are related to Christianity from me, feel free to hit that subscribe button. I upload sometimes on Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. I hope that you're having a wonderful week and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.